Uh, just real quick before we, we get into this heavy subject today. Um, Alexis is doing a Relay for Life, and if you are interested in more about that, on the, the bulletin board that we have in the back, you will see that, or you can see her, Alexis. Or she, Can you raise your hand? See her. She's putting a team together for that. July 23rd, don't forget, that's our Friendship Sunday, so if there's someone, please be in prayer about inviting them and taking them out afterwards. Um, Taylor, could you raise your hand? Taylor is heading up our nursery, and we're just so grateful for that, but if we are always in need of more nursery workers. So if that is something that you feel like you would be able to help out once in a while, it's not something that's done every week, but she could definitely use your help, so please see her after service. Um, and the last one is our baptismal service. So in a few weeks, we are going to be holding another amazing baptismal service at the um, Lake Cadillac at the amphitheater with the other two Nazarene churches. So if you are interested in knowing more about baptism, signing up for baptism, want to be baptized, there are sign-up sheets. Please put your name down, and I'll be in contact with you. Draw your swords. And turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. As you're turning there, John Wesley, in his sermon titled, The Important Question, he makes this statement. The present life will soon be at an end, for it will pass away like a shadow. And then the hour will be at hand when our spirit will be summoned to return before its maker. In that moment, how pleased it will be for those who hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. But how horrifying for the one who will lose his soul. If he looks back at his life, what will he see? Shame, remorse, and self-condemnation. And if he looks forward, what does he see? He will see no joy, no peace, and no hope. How different it will be between these two souls. For the former will be met by a convoy of angels bringing them before God, but the latter will be met by the devil and his angels. And that sad convoy will take the one who rejected Christ to a place of utter darkness and devoid of God and anything good. Has anybody here read the divine comedy? And not one, oh, we have one person. Oh, man, Crystal. All right. Oh, 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 you got to raise them up. Okay. So Sarah, possibly Madeline, I'm not sure. She read like half the book. Is that what that was? Okay. Marty, thank you. So we got, we got about four people. Um, I listened to the audio version uh, with a built-in commentary done by Hillsdale College. But if you're not familiar with the Divine Comedy, Dante was his name, and he lived in the 1300s, and it's considered probably one of the greatest literature pieces in history. Dante was a, a very successful man, but lived, um, boy, I think it was Florence, and they were in war and also civil war, and he found himself on the wrong side, and his property was seized by the government, and he was excommunicated never to return, but by the penalty of death. Just a little interesting fact, uh, just a few years ago, they finally lifted that um, being excommunicated but it was during that time that he began putting together this piece that was actually three pieces it's a, it's a poem into a book and each section 
um, I, they call it cantos, I think is how it's pronounced. There's a hundred of them. But it's really a, a, his own spiritual journey. I believe the three books were Inferno, Purgatorio, and Heaveno. Of course, Inferno is, is hell. And he has these guides that are taking him through this pilgrimage. Along the way, he is in a dark wood, halfway through his life, so he's around 35 years old, and he realizes he has walked away from the Christian faith. And here is a small little excerpt from this passage. Midway along the journey of life, it was there that I woke and I found myself in a dark wood. And I realized I had wandered from the straight path. And in that moment, Dante realizes he's in hell. Today we're going to talk about that dark wood. And we're going to look at what scripture has to say about that place called hell. So look with me this morning at Luke chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 19. It's coming up in just a second. Do we have it? Oh. I gave you Luke 17. That was my fault. That is not Emily's fault. I'm going to read it to you. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, follow along. But this is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. And he lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham from far away with Lazarus by his sides, and he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, O oh son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us there is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses, they have the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus is giving this story, and it's a very hot day. And the crowds have gathered around him to hear this young rabbi and what he has to say. The crowd is made up of those rejected by society. We have sinners and we have tax collectors, but they're not the only ones there. There's also the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the preachers and the teachers, the one that were supposed to know the law above everybody else in God's word. 
Unfortunately, they knew the word of God, but they knew it here, but never was transformed in here. They were more concerned about the legal parts of the law, about nuances in the law, about the control of the law, than the word of God being transformative in their life. In fact, I can, I can almost hear them snickering as they see Jesus surrounded by these, rejected by society, saying, how can he be a rabbi and rub shoulders with these people? And without words being spoken, God, Jesus, knows what's in their heart. And he turns to the crowd and begins to tell them this story. And he opens up about a rich man and a beggar. And this is what he says about the rich man. He says in verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple, fine linen, and he lived in luxury. Jesus gives three descriptions of the rich man. The first one is that he is dressed in what? Well, let's go with purple first. Purple. That's right. Purple came and was produced by a muscle. And they used that for the upper garment. And really only the wealthy would purchase that or the high priest. It was something that was very expensive. But Jesus doesn't stop there in describing the rich man because not only was he dressed in purple, but he also was dressed in fine linen. Fine linen. That's right, fine linen. What exactly is this fine linen? It, it was something different than just everyday linen. In fact, what this was was Egyptian flax. Now, how many here has heard of my pillow okay we got a lot of people my pillow guy right uh which love the guy he is actually a strong christian we want to support him but man his commercials get on my nerves it's like an info right am i the only one i'm like come on have someone else do these commercials um anyways they have these sheets giza sheets egyptian sheets that are supposed to be super soft now this Egyptian flax was made for the undergarment and was also used for mummies. It had a nickname called woven air and only the elite could purchase such an item. So here was a man who was dressed in purple, could afford the finest of the fine and fine linen, but it also says this in the third description. It says he lived in luxury every day. That is, he lived in a lifestyle that was excessive. He feasted in luxury every day, feasting on gourmet, exotic, costly dishes without end. He was a man that was so rich that his life was full of self-indulgence. There was nothing that he lacked or wanted for. Are you getting the picture? Everything at his disposable or disposal, there was nothing that he lacked. The Pharisees, for the first time, are hearing this message from Jesus. Now remember this. For the Pharisees, they connected wealthy position or possessions with spiritual blessing. I almost picture them as much as they dislike Jesus beginning to smile.
because they like the message. That's right. The richer you are, the more you have, the closer of, to God you must be, and he's blessing you. And then Jesus begins talking about the beggar. And again, he gives three descriptions, and he says this. He says, Then at the gate laid a beggar. His name was Lazarus, and he was covered with sores, and he longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked at his sores. Now, I don't know this for a fact. This is just a little tidbit here. Do you notice this? Lazarus has a name. The rich man doesn't. Jesus is surrounded by those that have been rejected by society. Whether because of personal sin, something that happened... Even the tax collectors who are now feeling guilty and have been rejected by everybody, even their own people. And maybe there's an internal turmoil within them of I am so guilty of what I have done. How could God ever accept me? And Jesus is reminding them that he knows you by name. But look at the descriptions. He says this, at the gate laid the beggar. That word, laid, is a Greek word, balo. And it means to throw or let go of a thing without care where it falls. It is giving a description of a helpless baby who has no say and can, cannot defend itself. In other words, Lazarus, who cannot do anything has been it's as if this he has been laid at the gate someone close to him has put him there and said i am done with you here you go good luck and leaves he was laid there he has no choice he can't do anything but hope but not only has he been laid at the gate but it says this it says he was covered with sores. Now, this isn't describing a bruised area on his body, but ulcerated sores that are open and excreting pus. Lazarus is laying on the ground, contaminated in a society who would want nothing to do with him, and his only hope is that someone, anyone, would come to him and give him comfort, maybe even touch him and say everything is going to be okay, but he knows who in the world would contaminate themselves and touch him. But then here's the third description. It says this. He just longed to eat from the scraps of the rich man's table. Lazarus had lost all sense of pride, and he longed just for a bite of the man's garbage. Now, in the first century, if you lived in in excess and because in the Middle East you ate with your hands and you just had disposable income do you know what they would use as napkins they would use the finest of bread so picture this here is a rich man that is living excessively. He is eating meat every single day in a culture where maybe you got meat once a week. Picture that for a moment. We, we really don't have an understanding to live in that kind of poverty where our only hope is maybe once a week we can eat meat. I mean, even today, if you are below poverty level, you can eat meat more than once a week. I remember one time my dad telling me, because my dad, that he grew up with 14 brothers and sisters. 
They had moved up here from Brownsville, Texas. His dad's parents had passed away. My grandma's parents had passed away, so they really didn't have it, that support system of family. And do you know what they ate every single day to live? Rice and beans every day. Rice and beans. In fact, they couldn't have milk every day. He said he remembers as a five-year-old he had coffee, his coffee or water. But he said every once in a while when his Aunt Tony would come to stay with them to help take care of the kids because my grandma was pregnant again, she would get my grandpa to put chicken in the rice. And that was a big treat. We don't understand that kind of poverty. Now here is Lazarus laying there and here is the rich man that has so much money living so lavishly that after he eats, he gets a piece of bread and he begins wiping his hands and throwing it out, but never toward Lazarus. And the religious leaders are listening to the story and they are still liking the story because the people surrounding Jesus are getting what they deserve just like Lazarus. But all of a sudden, Jesus is about to flip the message and make them very upset because both men have just died and entered into eternity. And here's what it says. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side and the rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. Now, Lazarus finds himself carried by angels to the side of the patriarch Abraham. The rich man finds himself in a place of torment. Can you imagine what the Pharisees are thinking as soon as he says that? They are probably ready to pick stones up and stone Jesus. Because their question is, well, what did the rich man do wrong? I mean, he didn't beat Lazarus. He didn't tell Lazarus to move. He wasn't mean to Lazarus. What is the problem? What did he do? The problem isn't what he did. It was what he didn't do. Here it is. Lazarus lay at his gate and as the rich man looks at him he neither feels pity nor concerned about an individual made in the image of God and in so rejecting his fellow man he rejected the one who created him but what I want us to see is in how does Jesus begin to describe this place that the rich man finds himself in? And here's what it says. In verse 23, it says, It is hell where the rich man was in torment. And he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called to him, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Dip the tip of his finger. Would you send Lazarus in water so that he can cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire? The word there, torment, is describing an ancient instrument that is forcing an individual to divulge truth because of such pain. The pain is so unbearable he is asking for help. I want you to hear this. This is from an author who is describing what hell is like. When the soul is separated from the body, it goes to the dreary regions of the dead where there is no grandeur, nothing beautiful in the dark abode. There will be no light. There will be no music. 
only groans and shrieks, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. For the sounds of curses and blasphemies against God and screaming at one another. It will be a place void of honor, duty, and only everlasting shame and contempt. And as one looks around, there will be no more relationships to enjoy because there will be no friendships in hell. So as heaven becomes that place of fullness and joy in the presence of God, the unhappy spirits will be cast to hell where there will be an absence of God just the way they wanted it. They will finally realize that God alone is the center of all created spirits and that a spirit made for God can have no rest apart from him. Banishment from his presence is the very essence of destruction to a spirit that was made for God. And if that banishment lasts forever, then it becomes everlasting destruction. Scripture describes hell over a hundred times. I'm going to quickly read through a few passages, and I want you just to listen. Jude chapter 1, verse 7. In a similar way, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, they served as an example of those who will suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Matthew 13, 41 through 42 says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and have them thrown into the furnace of fire and in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8, 12, But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away, because it will be better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the smoke of the torment will rise forever and ever, for there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. And then we have Matthew 25, 31 through 46, which we have up on the screen, because I think this is somehow tied to Lazarus and the rich man. Because when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people, run from another as a separate shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And the king will say, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance for the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. Then the righteous will say, well, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Because I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison, and you did not look after me. They will say too, Lord, but when did we see you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Isaiah 66, 24 says this, And they will go out and look upon dead bodies of those who rebelled against the Lord, 
and it will be a place where the worm will not die nor the fire ever be quenched. Now that passage sounded really familiar to me when I read it. And then I realized Jesus used those words. And we see this. Let's pull that up. If your hand causes you, this Mark 9, 43, yep, to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life main than to have two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. I wondered about that. Repeatedly we see this view of fire. Whether there's fire in hell, I don't know, but I can tell you this. Apparently that is the only word they found strong enough to describe what hell was going to be like. But why would Jesus add the phrase, the worm will never die? I'm almost wondering if it will be the conscience of man realizing he had a choice to trust God and he refused. And it will never go away. Here are some men that have long since passed that have given us short little quotes on hell. People do not have to do something to go to hell. They just have to do nothing. The safest road to hell is the gradual one. For the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful. They are successful rebels in the end, for the doors of hell are not locked from the outside, but from the inside. For hell is the highest reward that the devil can offer to those who are his servants. Philip Melanchthon was a professor in one of the oldest universities in the world, Heidelberg University in Germany. It was established in 1386. He lived in the 1500s. But there is a surviving story about him and his students when they left class one day. And here is what it says. As we were walking in Württemberg one summer day with several of my students, we heard an uncommon singing and we decided to follow the sound and we found a bird we had never seen before. One of my students stepped up and they said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what is that thing? And to our surprise, all of us heard it. It began to speak and said, I am a damned spirit. And as it flew away, it pronounced these words, O oh, eternity, eternity, who can tell the length of eternity? I wonder at the end of our lives, three score years, for those that will find themselves in hell, will pronounce the same words. Oh, eternity, eternity. I want to close with this last illustration. 
Some of you probably remember Paul Harvey, and that's the rest of the story. He has since passed, but he used to be on the radio and had great, great stories. This was written in 1965 and put on the air. Remember that. What do you think life was like in 65? Way different than today. And almost prophetic. He said, this is what I would do if I were the devil. If I were the prince of darkness, I would want to engulf the whole world in darkness. I'd have a third of its real estate, four-fifths of its population, but I would not be happy until I seized the ripest apple of all. So I would take over the United States. I would subvert the churches first, and I would begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young teenager, I would whisper, the Bible is a myth. I would convince children that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what is bad is really good and what is good is really bad. And for the old, oh, I would teach them a new prayer. I would tell them, pray like me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I would get organized. I would educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appeal dull and uninteresting. I would peddle narcotics to whom I could. I would sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction, and I would tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I would soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, nations at war with themselves until each in turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. Oh, if I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellect but neglect the discipline of emotions, and I would tell teachers to let those students just run wild. And before you knew it, you would have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. And with a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing, judges promoting pornography, and soon I would evict God from the courthouse, from the schoolhouse, and from the House of Congress. I would substitute in churches psychology for religion, and I would deify science above all else. I'd lure priests and pastors into misusing church money and his parishioners. Oh, if I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and who work hard, and I would give it to those who just wanted it until I killed the incentive to be ambitious. I would get states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that having sex outside of marriage is more fun, and that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus, I could undress you in public, lure you into bed with diseases for which there will be no cures. In other words, if I were the devil... I would just keep on doing what he's doing, where he will utter these final words, now you can be with me forever. Would you stand with me? There will be a day when every man and woman will stand before God and we will be judged. The king shall say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world and the angels will tune their harps and begin to sing. But how different it will be for those on his left. For those who will lose their own soul. 
No joyful sentence will be pronounced. But they will hear, Depart, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And who can doubt but those infernal spirits will immediately execute the sentence, and they will instantly drag those forsaken of God into the place of torment. And it will be regions of sorrow, a place of darkness and torment, apart from its maker, where peace and rest can never dwell, where hope never comes, and you open your eyes and you realize you are not in a dream, but have entered the dark wood. I don't know where you stand today. But don't you think today would be a good day to make that commitment? Whether it be for the first time, or maybe you just say, you know, Lord, I just need to recommit my lives, my life to you. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. Oh, eternity, eternity. Who can fathom how long eternity is? Would you close your eyes? And as you seek your heart and you sense the Spirit speaking to you, don't let today go by. If you are recognizing that And you are saying, Lord, today, I want to make that commitment. Would you raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you. This is the day. Don't let today go by. Maybe today you're reflecting on your own life. And I'm not saying you're not a Christian. But you're recognizing how easy it is for the devil to work his schemes in your life and you're saying I need to get back on the straight path I don't want to find myself like Dante described as wandering from that path and if you want me to pray for you would you raise your hand saying Lord help me to get back on this path Where the sun shines. Yes. Lord, on this day, we we talk about a heavy subject. And you know I don't like talking about it. But it's part of your word. And we can't just take certain parts. Those that we like. As much as heaven is real, hell is real. Would you help us to be awakened by the scheming of the evil one? Would you send the Holy Spirit to empower us to live the life you have called us to live? Would you remind us on this day that you are doing something in our lives? And maybe you're bringing something to our minds right now and you're saying, I want to grow in this walk with you, but you need to set this thing aside. And you know the struggle and the turmoil inside of us and how hard it is. Remind us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And that if you call us to do something, you will give us the strength to overcome. You recognize, Lord, how short life is. Help us to put it in perspective. Because, Lord, there will be a day when all will stand before you and 
the only hope for any of us will be if we proclaimed your son's name, Jesus. Help us. And may those behind us see you working in us. Would you have your way in our lives and we completely surrender and submit to the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And on this day, in July of 2023, everyone said, Amen. Amen.